Welcome to another edition of Crime Time with Duty Ron and Ed Wallace. We are two retired New York City police detectives with over 40 years combined experience in law enforcement. And if you like all things true crime related from that police perspective, hit the subscribe button, hit that notification bell, so you'll get all things Duty Ron and this guy over here. Where is he? He's over here somewhere. I'm poking him. Uh-huh. Wallace, when we go live and upload another video, I want to say a special thank you to the Patreon supporters, the channel members, and all of the folks who positively engage in this community. You guys are what makes it a great place. And Ed and I give you thanks and praise. We tip our caps to you, and we, we thank you for all your engagement. Ed, how are you doing tonight? Doing great, Ron. And yourself? I am not doing too bad after 10 hours of work and, uh, you know, running around with the dog, picking up dog poop in the backyard. I'm good, Ed. How are you doing over there with the dog? Well, I got a nap with the dog and I'm good. All right. <laughs> excellent. No more yawning for you. That's right. Hey, listen, so tonight, folks, we're going to be talking about the Gonzalo Lopez uh, ongoing search, a fugitive who uh, broke out of a jail bus uh, May 12th. It's going on day, we're on day eight, the, co- the completion of, of day eight. And uh, there's still no uh, sign of this guy. He's just gone with the wind. And uh, we're going to talk about the importance and how drone searching can help uh, cover massive, massive amounts of area. We got Gene Robinson from SAR Drones in Texas. And we also have a special guest, Ed Um I mean, we're going we're gonna to show a little piece of media from today. The Texas Department of uh, Criminal Justice gives an update. Uh, that was just hours ago, so we're going to play that in a few. But how excited are you for the guests that we have here today? We're going to let the cat out of the bag right now. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We have the uh, – should I do it or you want to do it? You could do it, brother. You do All it. All right. So we have the uh, family uh, that took the video, the young boy and his mom on the, in their car driving by and watching the uh, convict escape into the, uh, into the woods. Yeah. And you know what? Um, these are brave folks. Uh, I got to say, um, uh, you know, a lot of people would turn their backs and say, hey, this is, you know, this is a scary situation. I, 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 it's none of my business. Let, let the cops handle it. Let the law enforcement handle it. This was the exact opposite. And this is what I love about the great state of Texas. It's Texas, and, baby. And, and, and you know what? It's not even just Texas. But, and I'm just I'm partial to it because my grandparents lived there, you know, God rest their soul. When I was a kid, little boy, my dad used to, he didn't fly me there. He used to drag me in his old 1965 Beetle, Volkswagen Beetle. He'd throw me, my brother, my sister, and drive our asses down to Texas. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we spent many summers in Texas, and I love the great, great state of Texas. uh, Me too, me too. I love it. I love it. So they they did the exact... um, I would say what any good American would do. They took the video, they took the film, they notified the police department. We'll see it on video here, and I'm going to have them in person, me and Ed. So that's an extra treat for you guys in addition to Gene Robinson because Gene Robinson is the godfather of drone searching. He uh, He's amazing. So let's play this little clip. Um, again, you, you know, Texas Department of Criminal Justice we're kind of, I, I don't know about you, Ed, but I've had it up to here with these updates because there's nothing additional that they give. They just change little pieces, and we're going to hear him talk here uh, tonight. So let's go to the videotape as, who is that that always said that from the sports world? Ah, I can't What's remember. That? Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm listening. I'm going back in my memory of an old sports reporter. Um, somebody will tell me. Tell me down in the comments here. A New York sports where guy used to always say, let's go to the videotape. But oh, gonna, yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot his name, but uh, mm-hmm. I'll think of it. Gene, Gene's an old timer. He'll remember it. He'll tell me. He'll, he'll, he'll call me a dummy and say, come on now. All right, here we go, guys. We have continued to search western Leon County. We also moved into an area that was just a little bit off of our regular area that we've been searching to see if maybe there might have been any kind of movement. Didn't find anything there. So we're still looking and following any leads, any information that we might have coming in from the public. We want to continue to stress this is a very dangerous man. There's a $50,000 reward out for any information that's going to lead to his apprehension and conviction. Six feet tall, 190 pounds, Hispanic male. Everybody's got the graphic that we sent out yesterday of the photographs that were taken of him as he was boarding the transport bus over in Gatesville. I can tell you this, 
There has been an investigation into whether there was any suspicious activity that occurred from the time that the bus left Gatesville up until the time of the accident last Thursday. Law enforcement says that they have looked into all of that. And at this time, there is no indication that there was anything of a suspicious nature that occurred from the time that that bus left Gatesville up until the time of the accident. They've looked at everything that would give them any kind of evidence, no evidence showing any kind of suspicious activity. So I know a lot of people have been speculating a lot about a lot of things about that. I'll let this truck go by. We should consider changing things. I know there's been a lot of speculation about that, but what I can tell you right now, law enforcement has looked at it. Nothing of a suspicious nature from the time that that bus left Gatesville up until the time of the accident. So we are preparing uh, for possibility of severe weather coming into this area this weekend, maybe Saturday night on into Sunday. We've got um, Walmart over in Palestine that is donating uh, over 300 ponchos for the folks that are out here in the field. So we appreciate that very much. It's not that we don't have the resources for this ourselves, but the fact that we've got the support of the community is very much appreciated. It's also a steel mill over in Jewett that uh, came today and set up their uh, grill, their their portable grill, and they cook dinner for uh, they cook dinner for all the, the folks that are out here in the field searching for him. So we appreciate that very much. The fact that we've got the support of the community tells us that everybody is on the same page here. Everybody wants to get this man back in custody. But again, I cannot stress enough. This is a very dangerous man. If anybody sees him, knows anything about him, do not try and engage him on your own. Call 911. Call your local law enforcement agency. Let the folks that know how to deal with somebody like him deal with him. Don't try and do it yourself. You could bring harm to yourself. You could bring harm to your family. Please, if you see him, if you've got any information about him, call 911. Call the local law enforcement agency. Let them deal with it. So on that note, that's pretty much it for the day. I'll take any questions you might have real quick. Um, with the weather coming, possibly coming, are you concerned that it may like wash away any footprints or wash away any scent that dogs are tracking? There's always that possibility. There's always that possibility. But we're doing everything we can to look for any evidence right now before the, the bad weather comes in. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Let the truck go by. We will continue looking as far as how bad the weather gets. I, I can only say right now that we can we will continue looking. If the weather gets really bad, there could be the possibility of suspending the search for a short time, but we're not calling this search off. We will continue looking for him. If bad weather comes in and you know we've got like a tornado that comes through the area or hail or something like that. Obviously, we'll take we'll take the proper precautions for our folks out in the field. Uh, I was wondering some of the details that you clarified earlier earlier this week. Now, I know you said originally, um, Reidinger had shot out the back of the tires and then said he shot at him as Lopez was going away with the bus. Can you clarify a little bit? Because some are a little bit confused on how that could be if the back tires were already shot out apparently how would they then continue to shoot at him as lopez was driving away with the bus as you mentioned yesterday okay i'm on i'm on describe it again the information that i've been given he gets control of the bus after going into the front compartment and starting to fight with the officer that was driving the bus the officer that's in the back of the bus realizes what's happening the bus had come to a stop when the fight was going on, the officer that was driving the bus had stopped the bus. He and Lopez then spill out of the bus and continue fighting on the ground. Okay. The officer that's in the back of the bus, the bus is now stopped. The officer that's in the back of the bus goes out the emergency exit. He then sees what's happening with the officer and Lopez shoots out the back tires of the bus. The bus is stopped. Okay. Then Lopez gets back on the bus. He had tried to get the weapon away from the officer that he was fighting with. He tries to get the weapon away. The officer kept him from getting the weapon. Okay. Then Lopez gets back on the bus. This is all happening very quickly. He gets back on the bus and drives away. The two officers are still on the ground. The officer that he had been fighting with, the officer that had shot out the back tires of the bus. 
Lopez is driving the bus away with two flat tires in the back. He then goes maybe about a mile down the road, loses control of the bus, and then it goes off into the culvert on the westbound side of Highway 7. The two officers catch up to the bus. They run down the road. They catch up to the bus. That's when they see him running across the cow pasture northbound. Does that answer your question? So there was only one shot, not two. Because you had said they shot at him when he was driving away from the bus, but this is already a they shot, shot They shot at the bus tires while it was stopped. When they caught up to him, when they caught up to the bus, as he's running across the cow pasture, they fire shots at him as he's running across the cow pasture. They didn't hit him. As far as we know, there's no evidence. There's no indication that they hit him. They fired their service weapons. They fired their shotgun at him. Now, has that person, Melanie Kipperman, who saw it and didn't hear any shots that we, that most have seen that video, didn't hear any shots, who rolled up on the scene after the bus was stopped and said there was no shots fired or any on foot? I can't address what that woman says. I don't know anything about what she's, she's telling the media, okay? All I can tell you is what I've been told from our investigation standpoint, okay? And from, from what I'm being told by our investigators, those two officers... Those two officers fired shots at him as he was running out across the field. Maybe she didn't get there when the officer... When the, when the officers had fired the shot, maybe she got there after they fired the shots. I don't know, okay? But those officers are telling us that they fired shots at him as he was running out across the cow pasture. And I want to stop it there because <clears throat> this is going to be a, a, the basis of some of our conversation. This Is this guy a public what, information officer? It, it, it says Texas Department of Criminal Justice. He's the public information officer. And he's claimed that in many of his previous uh, news briefings. But what I, what I want to say to you, because you are a crime scene uh, unit expert, you're an evidence, uh, evidence expert. If they fired the amount of shots that he said they fired, that it would be clear and apparent in the investigation when they look at their guns to see how many rounds are spent from his revolver. I believe did he have driver, a revolver or semi-automatic? The driver had a revolver. Okay, and the and the and the, and the, the security guy had a shotgun. Um, mm -hmm. But our our guests that are uh, going to come on again, this guy this guy is just dismissing what this news uh, reporter Sarah from um, ah, shoot, it's a K K A T or something like that. K. She's from Houston. Me Melanie's going to tell me it because mm -hmm. she she's she's a group, one of the more accurate reporters, according to uh, Melanie, and, and she's got the stories correctly. You know, the uh, reason I'm asking is because he seemed to be very aggressive. He is. He's, he, yeah. he's being defensive. But what I wanted to say is, is that the evidence will show in their investigation how many shots were fired. I mean, Absolutely. I mean, whether it was a shotgun, um, I mean, there should be the spent cartridges from the shotgun, all right? right. right. Um, with a revolver, um, you... If you didn't empty the cylinder um, and you left the discharge cartridge cases in the cylinder, then that will be evident. Plus, we examine the front of the cylinder and we look for powder rings, uh, fresh powder rings around the front of the cylinders, which would, would distinguish itself from um, right. cylinders that didn't discharge any bullets. You know, that, that this is my point is, uh, again, it wasn't K-H-O-U. Uh, it was, oh, it wasn't um, K -H -O -U. Yeah, no, no, I have it here. I'm going to just look at it real quick because now it's bothering me that I don't know it. Um, it is K-A-G-S, uh, CAGS, K-A-G-S. So they're a local, you know, uh, news uh, outfit and they're, they're reporting stuff accurately. And Sarah was the news reporter who asked that tough question and he came snapping at her like, I don't know who this woman is. But listen, with, without further ado, I want to introduce Gene from uh, RP Search. Uh, he's a great, great friend of uh, Crime Time with Judy Ron. And I, I appreciate you, Gene. Uh, is the lag better? Did you fix that? Well, I hope so. It uh, it was kind of disconcerting, but I'll just continue like it's not there, and hopefully it'll it'll work itself out. Yeah, we might have to do a fundraiser to get uh, maybe Gene some extra, like the same thing with Twyla, better internet and a better computer. I, I don't know. Gene, how you doing, buddy? I am well. I, I've been kind of watching this one with great interest, and uh, uh, you know me, I, I'm all into the drone situation, and there was something that that 
that PIO said that is key to this whole thing. They said that the weather was coming and uh, some astute reporter asked, is that going to do anything to mess up any evidence that you may see? Of course it will. Absolutely. And uh, one of the things that I, I, from experience, I can tell you that uh, we went out on a case and uh, looking for a missing endangered adult. And they deployed us and we flew around and we flew over some plowed fields. And one of the things that we stress now is you need to look for trace evidence. This is some things that you can only see from the drone. And we did. We saw a line of footprints walking through a plowed field. And, uh, well, we thought that was interesting. So we continued the same path. We went and actually investigated the footprints and found which direction they were going, kept going. And then we found some clothing and then we kept going and we found uh, the, the guys had scrawled his kids' names on a culvert on a bridge and then went down just a little bit further. And there the guy was, and that was all from trace evidence. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that I would, and, and I don't mean to armchair quarterback, because I know they're out there working their tails off trying to catch this perp. Uh, but one of the things that drones could do right now is go out into those fields, whether they're grass, because if it's a grass field, you can see a trail cut through grass just as clear as day from two or 300 feet. Uh, you could follow that. You could see uh, tracks in the dirt. Those are the things that you should be out looking for right now if you had drones. And again, I don't know. I don't think I have heard that that resource has been brought to play, has it? I, no. I think I think they're using uh, from the helicopter, and I'll show some footage from it, from uh, the Texas Department of Public Safety or whatever, yeah. Sheriff's Department. I saw a helicopter with a guy hanging over the side, and they were using um, uh, infrared probably and, you know, like the heat. You know, looking for you know any kind of heat and body temperature and they're talking about temperatures in in that area close to 100 degrees um right. you know we know that that still wouldn't affect that technology but that's what they were using um but the bottom line is is the drones and um locate that's what i was concerned about what if this guy stripped off that white or pieces of that white prison uniform and left it in the in in in, in a remote area Talk about what Locate does just a little bit, and then we got to bring on our special guests. Well, you know, I would want to shift gears a little bit on you there, Ron, because uh, Locate is good for locating colors, uh, but the radiometric data tool set that he's just released uses FLIR imagery now. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that, that we can do is analyze FLIR imagery, and yes, 100 degrees out there, you blow out a FLIR sensor, it's, uh, it's really difficult to do much with. However, since this is such a, an intensive manhunt, and they're, they're ostensibly doing this 24 hours a day, that by early morning, if you've deployed drones that have FLIR, this software can pick up two-tenths of a degree difference from ambient. It's really an amazing piece of software. Wow. And this is something that, that could be done. The, the drones can be kept in the air literally 24 seven. And as I understand it, they've narrowed it down. This, this individual is a, a supposedly an outdoorsman of some sort. And he obviously is a criminal. So he is gonna recognize that there are gonna be patterns that uh, Ellie is gonna take to try to find him. So he may have holed up, but you can keep a drone in the air 24 hours if necessary. And they're cheap, easy, and you can keep a drone crew out there patrolling that area very easily. And if you get any sort of indication on FLIR, it could change the case literally in minutes. Yeah, and especially at nighttime when the temperatures drop and you can get the drone up in the air and you have that now temperature drop. So then the flare would be uh, very um, useful in, in tracking down the um, uh, somebody running through uh, a canopy or uh, the fields or, or whatever the case may be. Even you could even pick up their foot in um, heat signatures um, from where they ran through. Uh, it's I've, I've used it in um, cases where I had our aviation unit from the NYPD come over and fly over 
and you could see the heat signature of somebody running through a, a marshy area um, because of the uh, difference in temperatures between the person and the environment. Yeah. So it, it, it's amazing technology, and I'm shocked that the great state of Texas hasn't used this. And, and it, I've gotten many, many messages on dutyround.com from some of the ladies and, and gents from the from Texas and from that area talking about budget problems and that they're, they're, they're chinting out on certain things with the Department of Corrections over there. And uh, listen, Leon County, I don't know much about it. I don't know the statistical data, uh, what kind of manpower they have there. But at the end of the day, they should be thrown, as Dave Rader would say from EquiSearch, the kitchen sink should be thrown at this thing. I, now, Ron, I, I can say that if the Department of Public Safety is involved, they have a very robust drone program. Yes, they do. So mm -hmm. if they're involved, I'm almost assured that they are out there flying the kind of patterns that we talk about doing right now. There's there's obviously no need to uh, mm -hmm. broadcast what their, their tactics are at this point, but uh, I'm sure that they're out there using every resource they can, and it's going to include drones if the DPS is involved. Yeah, I know for a fact the Rangers have them. Yeah, so potentially they could be out there, and we don't we don't know anything about it. Um, listen, my next guests, I want to bring them on uh, because they've been patiently waiting. Um, Melanie, Robert, and Braxton. Melanie and uh, Braxton, uh, we saw them on news. We're going to play a little news clip of that. Uh, they were the folks who um, videotaped um, the perpetrator uh, as he was running out in the field. Thank you for that super sticker, Ron Daniels. I appreciate it. Gonzalo Lopez on that faithful day. So let's uh, give a warm welcome uh, to, in the chat to uh, Melanie, Robert, and Braxton. Thank you so much for joining Crime Time with Duty, Ron. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Listen, I want to say right off the bat, first off, uh, Braxton, you get the uh, Hero of the Year Award for working the camera and taking the, the video that we saw. So... Uh, Mom and Dad uh, should be very proud of you. You you listened to directions good, and you did a great job. How do you feel about that, pal? Good. <laughs> Mom, if you could, uh, you know, walk our, our audience uh, through, and, and the audience here are, you know, pro-law enforcement and, you know, supportive of great American heroes like yourself. And you may not think that you're a hero, but I have to say what you did that day was the only recorded information uh, available right now, not only to the, to the public, but to the corrections officials and police. So what you did was a great, great thing. And as uh, retired law enforcement professionals, me and Ed Wallace, over 45 years in law enforcement, we, uh, we commend you for what you did. Um, so congratulations on getting that footage, uh, you and your son. Um, any thoughts about that day? Um... I'm really not sure where to start. Um, Hello. This has been so stressful since then. Um, I have to actually, I'm so stressed. I have to think about every single thing that I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, we were, um, Thursday we were on our way home from school. Um, and when I came up over the hill, I saw a um, Jewish police officer sitting in the middle of the road and the big white bus was kind of off into the ditch, up to the fence. And at first I thought that they were having maybe a car, car trouble or blown tire or something. And they were just trying to get the vehicle off the road because there's not a curb to pull up on. Um, next thing I know, um, there's um, an inmate coming out and came, went to the fence, jumped the fence and took off running and that's uh, the point that I, I realized what was going on. Um, it, it was, I wish I had my video camera going at that time or asked Braxton to, but it just took me a little while to process just what we were witnessing. Right. Yeah, and you know, things happen so quickly and you know, you don't expect to come across something like this in your everyday travels. And you and I spoke on the phone earlier today and you were saying how peaceful your community is and, and how you're not used to this type of, you know, excitement. So it, it definitely was something that would catch anybody off guard. And 
as we could see, the corrections uh, professionals on that bus, they were probably caught off guard too. And the local police officer that was trailing that vehicle um, was seeing it driving erratically. So um, again, you know, what you, what you experienced and what you saw that day, I don't know what that noise is. Is that like, um, is that a phone? What is it? That's my phone dinging. Oh, okay. Oh, All right, my yeah. man. It, it, it's loud. Uh, you're, getting, you're getting messages because you guys are stars right now. I'm actually the um, lead um, sheriff investigator answering some questions I was just asking about the drones. Oh, okay. So, great, great. Any wow. any uh, any insight on that that you can talk about? Um, he, he did. I asked him specifically that if they were using drones, and he said many drones um, okay. have out there. So that Good deal. Guys with that. Um, so... Um, he, right here, he just said this. It's getting dark. They're getting ready to run ten sets of packed dogs with two planes overhead tonight. So, I've been tracking. I'm, I'm a pilot also. Okay. So, um, so the plane that they've been using, and Gene will be familiar with this, is the uh, Pilatus. They mm -hmm. bought it a, a few years back, I believe. They've been using it down there um, on the border, mostly for the um, uh, the illegals crossing it and stuff. And, Tail down there, but they've had it up here about every night doing circular patterns. It'll be here two hours. It flies back to Austin, fills back up, which is about a, I believe, about an hour flight for that, and then they're back up doing patterns again. Right. Uh, but Gene will know what kind of more um, equipment they have in that. It's going to be more thermal equipment and stuff. Like yeah, and they have the lidar uh, flare on the on the pod on the wing. Yeah, yeah. I'm familiar with it too. Uh -huh. okay. So that's so that's good stuff. You can cover a lot of ground with that, and that's what's yes, important, you know. Uh, the neighbors and residents, and you know, it's a it's a rural community. You're you're you know farming community, right? Um, it's there's not houses bunched on top of each other. Um, what's the sense of the folks in 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 your community? Is everybody worried? Everybody scared? Just let the audience know what's happening in in Leon County and in your community. Well. So we are a very, it's a very, very tight knit community. So it's a county of 17,000 with about five little, what we call like little small towns, 500 people to 900. So Centerville is 900 people. Um, most people are rural, lots of ranchers, a lot of, uh, this part of Texas is hilly, lots of trees, heavy trees, heavy woods. Um, and Melanie hates me for saying this, but most people, and I have a lot of patients, do not lock their doors. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, matter of fact, she don't hate me for this too, but it took us about a half day to find our keys for our doors to lock. <laughs> <laughs> I, I totally get that. I, I fear mm -hmm. we were the same way, and we just hardly ever locked our doors either. Yeah. But now we lock them every day when we leave. It, it's a incon major inconvenience. So. On, on that also, everybody takes care of everyone. Everyone knows everybody. Um, and the community is all together. We're all together. I even started a Facebook group for the search area because there's so many people all over the United States that are getting on our local pages, Facebook pages. And it's Trying just to stay updated. And it's so many rumors. So I started in the search area, a Facebook group, so we could keep a track of no rumors, but exactly what's going on. Mm -hmm. And so. That's and support being, each other. Yeah. Yeah. And, so, the, and if I may ask you a question, um, there's a lot of, from, from what I've uh, done down in Texas, there's a lot of nocturnal animals down there, uh, especially wild boar uh, and uh, some other carnivores that are down there. He's going to have his hands full if he doesn't find shelter. Uh, yeah. So you're, you're right. Um, it's a big hog hunt down here. If you've never been here, hog yeah, hunt is just, it's just like going down to the local swimming pool in New York, I guess, and go swimming. Mm -hmm. Everyone's like, let's go hog hunting. No, and I've done hog hunting down there uh, oh. in Texas, outside of Dallas, uh, at night <laughs> with the Texas Rangers. Uh, it was yeah. fun. So there's two kind of hog hunters here. You have the hog hunters that go out with the night vision or rifles and take them out. And then you have your tough hog hunters, who are mm -hmm. usually your ranchers and roopers, that go out, jump off, hog tie them, and load them up and take them and sell them 
for me to, to people. Oh, so oh, that's how, I mean, this is normal life to us. It, it's it's just, good barbecue. It is good barbecue. Yes, it yeah. is. <laughs> so um, we've got that. Then you have your what's big down here, rattlesnakes, water moccasins and copperheads. Yeah. So that's going to be a big thing that this guy is, is going to uh, deal with, with that environment. Heat, mm -hmm. humidity is, is out there right now. We've had that. Um, and then the helicopter reported, I think it was yesterday morning with their vision that they, uh, um, in the area, they jumped up a black uh, panther. Whoa. And so we do have panthers run around. It's years, people say, oh, there's no panthers. He jumped it up and sure enough, and we've known in our area about a five mile radius here that there's a couple panthers running around and uh, sure enough. But have they been taking a toll on the ranchers? No, you know, we don't hear too many ranchers. We hear a story every now and then yeah. of, uh -huh. of some evidence of them attacking from the back. Right. Okay. So Melanie, could you tell us how you rolled up on, on the scene? Did you did you drive towards the front of the bus or come up from it from the rear? Or how, how did you approach? Um they were I guess they came from, I was leaving Centerville and they were going towards Centerville. But I guess at the point in time when I saw it, I was worried about where the guards were. Mm -hmm. I didn't see any guards at all the entire time I was there. The only officer I saw was a local Jewett police officer in his car who had evidently been following the bus and had stopped when the bus wrecked. And I was very concerned about where the officers in the bus uh, shot, killed, hurt. Where were they? Mm -hmm. um, while this um, inmate is running off, um, the, the Jewett police officer is just standing there. Mm -hmm. He's not doing anything. He's not going to the bus. I'm thinking, why isn't he going at least checking on the officers on the bus? Right, um, so he so he didn't see uh, the inmate run away. Uh, yes, he you, saw the inmate. Well, he did, and he didn't exit his vehicle or anything. Uh, he did finally get out, but he stood by the vehicle. Um, Is that the officer you and your son told? Uh, that we drove real slow. Right. By. He's in the video. Yeah, right, right. And you told him, and you, you know, go look in the. He's over there in the woods. Yeah, man, it, he had he had fear all over his face. He didn't know what to do. Uh huh. And what about you, Braxton? You didn't seem to be afraid. Are you taking that camera and you got that uh, the white uh, uniform running through the woods in the background? Well, I was really devastated when I did see it all happening because it oh. looked like there was a movie scene. <laughs> like the back of my eyes. Yeah, it felt like one. You may be too young for this, but when you when you get off the show, go to Google and look up the Bigfoot video, okay? Uh, <laughs> Because that's what that's what your video reminded me of. The guy in the white, it was like Bigfoot walking into the woods. <laughs> yeah, but I could tell the way he was running. He was slinging his arms side to side. I knew yeah. he did not have anything on him, no shackles whatsoever. Did you notice if there were any other prisoners in the uh, bus when you drove by? I could hear every one of them. It was oh. eerie. They were all yelling and screaming. I heard I found out later there were 15 other inmates on there Wow! Um, and only two guards. And I've been told there's supposed to be three, but they were shorthanded. So only had two this time. Well, that's news. Okay. Uh, that doesn't bode well, but no. I'm glad to hear about the drones and then the fixed wing aircraft that are up there now doing their pattern searches. Uh, nighttime is probably the best uh, if they're going to be using that forward looking infrared um, um, to do this. Uh, Gene, you have anything to add? No, that uh, that Pilatus is uh, is a very nice aircraft. It has a nice long loiter time. Oh, yeah. uh, it can it can fly slow if necessary, and or it can fly fast. I mean, from Houston to 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 Austin, and my one seventy two is is typically you know two hours, mm -hmm. but uh, you know it, it's got a pretty good cruise speed as well. And uh, man, it's. Uh, the the Taze ball that they have in there, the Taze duo, I'm sure is what the one that they're they're flying with. The uh, uh, it has both night vision and clear, yeah. so uh, it's got a nog on board, and they're, they're probably uh, scanning the heck out of it. I'm sure that uh, they're covering a lot of ground while they're at it every night. Hey, I'm a little, I'm a little, 
I, I'm sorry, Melanie. I, I, I didn't mean to talk when you were talking, but I wanted to ask you guys based on what Jean just said and some of the people in the chat are, there's a lot of folks who think that this guy is down, in, you know, gone into Mexico. What's the feel of the folks of, you know, um, of the county there? Does, does every, I mean, everybody's going based on what, the law enforcement and the, um, you know, the, the TDJ, uh, CJ is telling you, right? Um, what do you, what do you guys feel? Um, how do you, how are you guys taking this? Like, They're saying they think 95% sure that he's still here. But the more this every day that goes on, I think more and more people are beginning to think that he is, he's left the area. Right. But there's so many houses, like we're in a rural area where there's, camp hunting houses and old abandoned churches to um, what else? Um, just structures like that, weekend homes. Because right. we're in between Dallas and Houston and those people come here and just have a weekend place. So there's a lot of structures that people are not going to all the time. Yeah. What if you're hiding out in one of those? I mean, yeah, they're vacant. Yeah. Good this yeah. whole time and nobody's even been in there to look. Yeah, there's, yeah my, so, there's so many possibilities Ed, where they, where he could be. Yeah, yeah. Well, my family has a large spread of land on the Mexican border, um, south, uh, south west of San Antonio, and uh, they had a few um, ranch houses on there. But they lease the land out to hunters, and the hunters go there and they'll 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 use the cabins. But um, recently, the the cabins have been destroyed by illegal border crossers. Uh, going in there and sheltering there for some period of time before they moved on. And we won't even get to the border right now because we can do a complete yeah. show about that. Uh, yeah. I want to show with your permission, Melanie, the infamous 28 second video that Braxton uh, recorded. Um, you shared it with me. I think this is a real high res, um, you know, when the news was playing it, it looked a little f fuzzy, but this one looks pretty clear. I'd like to play it with your permission, if that's okay. Yeah. All right, here we go. Uh, this is the video that they recorded on the on the day as they were driving by. So I'm going to go full screen with it, and let's play it. Oh, wait. Oh, wait, this is not it. Okay. So that's the Texas Department of Public Safety helicopter. Right. Yeah. yeah. Did you yeah. guys record that? Yes. Okay, so that was from your phone. I'm gonna just I'm just gonna pick up the next clip, but I want to let the rest of this play because it actually gives our audience a good look. This is the day. This is 20 minutes, 15 minutes after um this all occurred, uh, Melanie. Correct me if I'm wrong. They were Gosh, that was a few was, days after. It was Friday. Friday, So the, yeah. the okay. escape happened about 1 o'clock, 1.30 Thursday, and then Friday um, afternoon, I'll make this quick, Melanie was at lunch with me. They called Melanie and said, hey, the, the uh, DEA guy that we know real well called Melanie and said, are you home? And Melanie said, no, um, I'm in uh, uh, Buffalo, which is 20 miles north of us. Uh, where we just ate lunch and he said, well, someone has just called in that he was spotted back behind your house on the other side of the woods. And so we're all headed that way to search. And uh, it's like, wow, here we go. So uh, they canceled all my patients and I said, man, let's go to the house. And she said, I'm not going to the house. <laughs> and I said, no, let's go. Was, you know, it's just, you feel strong, supportive, and I'm like, let's go. I want to be there. I want to be in my home. I've got guns, and we'll be okay. So we went ahead and gave them permission to go ahead and go through our house, which it was locked, but she couldn't remember if one of the doors was locked, but it was. And uh, these guys are awesome that we know. And they, even though it was locked, they went through our doggy door and still searched our house mm -hmm. for us. And then they proceeded on back behind us. And then when we got home, these are, that's the video we took of um, the helicopter. They were there about right, four, right. Hours, four yeah. hours searching with ground yeah. crews, dogs. dogs. They said the dogs picked up a scent that were headed towards our house. So that's why they were so concerned about us mm -hmm. here. And then four hours and nothing. 
So then they went back to the original place that they'd been searching for like five days. They stay on the same location for five days. Same location, it's one square mile radius. It seems they will not pull away from that. So there's a, that's the, anyway, that's the video of the helicopter. Hey, back hey, hey Gene, um, any, any, um, any like kind of commentary on why they would stay in that one particular place? Um, maybe they felt strongly that he was holed up in a certain area. Like, why are they searching and researching the same places? Well, one of the things that uh, is just a premise for any search doesn't make any difference whether it's a missing person or not. Uh, you want to do that two mile probability of area. And two miles is basically, if you look at it, it's four square miles. Right. So you want to scour that four square miles just as thoroughly as you possibly can to ensure that that individual is not there before you move on to the other. Uh, so, you know, that's just a, a basic search premise. Uh, place last seen, uh, probability of detection is, is, uh, is the highest there to begin with, at least statistics show. Obviously, this guy is wanting to evade and willingly be missing. So that ups the difficulty factor significantly more because regardless of whether it's a drone or a helicopter, the, the Pilatus is going to be a little bit more difficult because it is a high altitude aircraft uh, and it can still see <laughs> a pretty good ground resolution from altitude. Uh, he's going to do as much as he can to evade, but they're going to want to try to get that area where the, the event occurred scrubbed as thoroughly as possible. How's the uh, night uh, been down there? Has there been a lot of cloud cover? Is there, um, cause we've had no, a full. No, we no, we have had clear blue skies and uh, it's been a little windy, right. but uh, we have not had any weather. It's been very conducive to any sort of operations at night. Uh, and, and pilot parlance, we've been visual flight rules for the last two weeks. Great, right. um, and, yes. and we've had a, we just entered a full moon cycle in the yeah. in the beginning of the week. So um, I doubt you know what, without uh, nods, I doubt he's moving around too much at night. I, you know, and that's probably one of the reasons they're they're staying close. They're thinking that he is not moving. He's hunkered down somewhere. Uh, you know, he could have any. You, we could speculate all day long, but. Uh, uh, there is a good possibility that he's hunkered down. He's found a place that is relatively safe and secure. He's going to let everybody kind of, you know, work themselves to the point where they're tired and about ready to give up and then start making a move. Yep. But uh, again, you know, if you can keep eyes in the sky, whether it's a drone or Pilatus or anything else, 24 seven, that's when he's going to slip up. Something, a foot's going to stick out. Uh, you know, you're going to have to dash to go visit Mother Nature or something like that. And he's going to get caught. Right. And somebody in the chat just said, Judy Fisher said, I wouldn't be able to sleep at night knowing he was somewhere out there. The mm -hmm. difference is, uh, Judy, is this community, um, I would say 98 or 99 percent of the residents are armed and they're not afraid to use their weapons. You know, we. We hear of counties down in Florida, Polk County. Uh, you heard Grady Judd, uh, the sheriff. He said uh, if, when, during the, the summer of 2002 when there was the, the riots over the George Floyd uh, situation, he got on national television and said, my residents and my, my, my people of Polk County are armed and they're dangerous. Do not come and try to burn our houses down because if you do, I've instructed my residents to shoot to kill and and i was i i couldn't believe that i heard him say that but i was so proud and happy that he did say that mm -hmm. so i feel that this community here um is uh they're not afraid and they're going to defend themselves and they're going to defend their property and their families and and, and that's the difference um you know they're not gonna it's a down. small community and everybody knows everybody down there and they know when things are out of out of order they know when things are you know just not right or you know Right. And so Robert, I can't imagine you were in this situation without having my gun rights and being able to have the right to carry and bear arms, especially right now. I can't imagine just having to sit vulnerable in my home, you know, not feeling safe to even walk outside. 
you know? see, uh, what happened out here, and I know this is going to happen, will be me, would be Melanie, um, probably. And any man out here in this territory, if we see him walk our fence line, if we see a glimpse of him, we'll go after him to shoot him and then call 911. <laughs> yes, uh, okay. that's correct. Take uh, care of business first. Yeah. I love yeah. it. All right. I finally got, <laughs> I love it, Robert. Uh, I took my cap to you. Kudos. I only wish that the um, the, the deputies on, on scene there would have taken care of business right away. Uh, once this guy became a fleeing felon in uh, in the um, in, in the law of, of the United States, you can shoot a fleeing felon. Um, you know, and and I think that um, I think that if they would have uh, had the opportunity, they probably would have. And let's just let's just hope and pray this thing comes to uh, a resolution um, sooner than later. But here we go, Braxton. I promised I would find it. You know what happened? Your mom and hundreds of other people have sent me so many videos and stuff. It got buried and I couldn't find it. So I I, I finally found it, kiddo, and I'm going to play it because here we go. This is um, two, two minutes and 28 seconds, actually. So. Um, it's a little bit longer than what we said, but this first frame in the middle right here where my cursor is, is that little white dot here. Uh, that's him. And we're going to see him. Um, I'm going to keep playing it back. I'm going to play the beginning of it uh, a couple of times. So let's go full screen. So all of the people here, we've got almost 900 people watching. So let's uh, let them take a peek at what uh, Braxton and, and, and his mom did that day. This is May 12th. Right, guys? Yes. Yes. Inmate. Oh my God! The... Yo, we saw the inmate. Oh my God! What the heck? And that's him. He's actually running off. What do you say? That is that about? Uh, the... Yo, what is that about? Three the... hundred yards. What are we looking at there? Um, We're just trying to. Probably just to that, well. that point probably was. Yeah. Uh, probably a good way to estimate that is Braxton deer hunt. Was that about us? Far as you shot that deer. Well, no, this when year? I shot my deer, I think it was four hundred yards. Three, three twenty-five. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, but, but but you guys were on the road, right? Pulled? Yes. Are you? Were you pulled over to the side, or were yes. you just? Yes. Well, mm, there's not much of a shoulder, so I really, I was really still in the road. All right. So you pulled to the little to the right. Is it a two-lane road, or is it one way yeah. each way? It's two, two lane with no shoulder. Yes. Okay. So she's to the right side. Uh, looks like um, three to four foot grass uh, or, you know, you know stuff growing. Right. That, that area is pretty thick, but where the bus wrecked, um, it, it wasn't that bad. We're going to see it. We're going to see it, I, I believe, in this clip. So let's let this play from the beginning. I just okay. kept going back over it because I wanted everybody to see. Um, right here where my cursor is going around in a circle is the little spot. I wish I could make this bigger. I know. Um, I'll you a little bit. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm just going to do that. And um, let's see. But then I can't. Well, that gives you guys a better look right here in the, in the center of the screen. Uh, that's him. And, and he's um, just marching off into the... Hold on a second, I can't. I gotta play it from here. Yo, we saw the inmate. Oh my god. What the heck? The bus is right up to the right there. I wanna stop it where so you guys can see. Okay, so right where her right rear view mirror is on her truck. There's a police vehicle straight forward on the opposite side of the street facing her. And um and and you can see the bus right here, right up over the um over the rear view on her passenger side. Um that's how close they were. And that's where he was at that time. Um and she passes just in a short time after this and says, He's out there. Uh, and he, so that, at top you can see he's just standing by his car right there. Just yeah, standing I see him right here. Yes. Right there. See, now if they could have got an air asset out there as quickly as possible with that high grass from that bird's eye view, you could see his uh, path through the through that area. Uh, Eddie, uh, Eddie, the perp, the perp is just right here to the right of this. No, well, he's a little further away, but 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 the point is, like I said, it, Gene just agreed. If we would have gotten an air asset up there, you would have found that that yeah. path 
because uh, nobody traverses through there. So he's the only one going through there. He's making his, right. his path. Now, if you're on the ground and you're tracking, you're looking for sign, you'll see plenty of sign. Uh, you know, you see that the, um, the uh, foliage and the uh, indigenous plant life has been, you know, crushed by him passing through there. You might even find bits of hairs and fibers from his clothing and so forth, or, you know, they get caught up on stuff uh, and you'll definitely see footwear uh, impressions uh, running through there. So even a good horse, if you could have got a horse in there uh, immediately or some uh, after this guy, well, or, he, or a local that, rancher, a local rancher with an AR across his back. Well, <laughs> yeah, hell, I was just thinking, I was just thinking from that window with my three hundred eight, he, he's gone. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's let the rest of this play. It's two minutes and twenty eight seconds. I'm gonna let it play in its entirety here. Yo, we saw the inmate. Oh my god. What the heck? <laughs> Is that a diesel? Yes. See how city slickers pick up on that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had a Glock right beside me too, but there you go. Having a concealed handgun license, first thing they tell you is never shoot them in the back running. So, um, there we go. Yeah. I have my Texas concealed carry permit, but now you don't need it. Right? Nice. <laughs> so that's just a little bit forward. I said I was going to let this play in its entirety, but she just moved up maybe yeah. five, ten feet, and that's the open area. Looks like yeah. there's a house out in the background there. Is that is that a house there? Uh, I don't know where the house sits. I've not been on that property in the house. The structures are kind of up in the woods over there. So I'm not quite sure. Okay. Um, that's that's a not a house right there. I think okay. if you zoomed in, I remember that's like um, round bells of hay or yeah. something right there. Yeah, it's hard to see. Yeah, yeah. There was a house open. Oh, crap. Did you hear what Braxton said? Everybody in the chat, he said, "Does he have a weapon?" And what was your answer to that, Mom? Uh, I don't even know if I answered him. All right, let's, <laughs> let's, let's listen again. A gun? Weapon? Oh crap! No. Uh, he tried to get one, but he couldn't get it out of the holster. Right. I, I didn't yeah. know. Um, oh. And I'm the one rolling the window up because we're getting close to the bus, and I'm nervous that another inmate may come out. Mm -hmm. Right. So you're rolling up the window for safety. Um, there was a lot of bugs out there. It looked like they, they were swarming all around the uh, window. That's terrible right now. Mm -hmm. I know you were saying that in the long version of the video. They're going to watch it. They're going to watch it. Keep going. Um, okay. All right. Here we go. You're going to pass that officer. Here's the guy's okay. What guy? The, um... So there's the Jewett police officer, no. and he's out there. Yeah. I mean, he's just looking at the bus. Did, did you at any time see him go over to that bus? No. No. Um, yeah. I never saw the guards at all. Um, and... He was following that bus when it crashed. So even though, you know, it doesn't look like he got out and moved far from his car, he watched that guy get out just like I did. So now is there is there um um barbed wire fence that I saw there? Uh it's a field fence, so it's like square fencing. So uh -huh. it's easy to put I have it for my goats because I have a goat farm, and it's easy to put your foot in there and pop pop right, right over. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I was wondering if there was any barbed wire that it maybe caught his no. clothing or cut him or something like that. No. And there may be one strand on top. I couldn't. I didn't examine it like that. Mm -hmm. We're going to see it close up here, and I have some pictures that she sent to me. Um, uh, well, one picture of it, which is a pretty good picture, she took. Um, I think tonight, right? Sent to me. Yes, tonight. Yeah. Okay. 
He's in the woods. And what was his response when you said it's a, he's in the woods? I know. Yeah, that's what he exactly said. Nothing else. Just, I know. Oh, wow. Even. All right, here we go. He's in the woods. Yeah, I know. They're all hollering really loud. It was kind of scary. Wow. I just want to see the fence again. He's in the woods. Yeah, it's three feet. And it was 15 inmates in that bus at that time. Yes. What and, the, and you were right. You were right, Melanie. The, the back door was shut. Yeah. Who bails out of the back knowing there's a confrontation with an inmate up front, out, you know, outside, and you're going to go to help, but you're going to take the time to shut that door. Now this is uh, this is the caged area in the back where the other correction officer is. Isn't that yeah. is that right, Ron? Yes. Right. But he's not in it because according to um, no, he Harris, jumped out. Right. He, he jumped out. Yeah. He jumped and out. Shot out the back tires while his partner was wrestling on the ground with the perp. Yes. Right. And then the perp got back in the the bus. Uh, mm -hmm. Lopez got back in the bus, drove it off with a flat mm -hmm. tire or two. We're not sure. Um, and then. They ran after the bus after fighting with him all that time and caught up to it a mile. Uh, yeah, and the one the road. one guy had two superficial superficial stab wounds. But but after fighting with for your life, um, now you're going to sprint in a hundred degree temperature up the road um, a mile and a half down the road and catch up with the bus. Yeah, and right. then yeah. So no. hey, um, Rob, tell you one other thing that I, I want to put for your viewers in perspective. So if you were to make like a triangle, Centerville's on one corner, and then we're on Highway 7 that goes to a corner, another triangle goes up to this town called Jewett. Like I said earlier, Jewett may be a town of like 500. So this police officer, he lives in Centerville, drives down 7, and then up to work at Jewett. He's a one man guy, you know, small town, 600 people. Right. I don't know. They may pay him 20,000 a year. Wow. So, um, and, and everyone in the whole world knows him cause he loves to give tickets going to that little town, mm -hmm. but he's not a fan of the people. Yes. So he's also have, and I hear this, I've heard this from our local PD. He's also known to not ever wear his gun belt, but he puts it in the seat next to him. And I cannot, and I'm telling you this in case you can zoom in and see if he is not gun, wearing a gun belt, his radio on him. So he don't have his gun belt standing out there. I don't know. He might. So uh, take a look at it again. I don't think he had a gun belt on. I think it's just a little oh, radio. He didn't. He didn't. Yeah. So he wasn't going to do anything. Hold on. Let me put that on. Now, at the time that he, at that location, he's out of his jurisdiction. Oh, he's got something on, I think. Hold on. I'm going to go full screen. Um, I have it zoomed in, so it's, let's see. Go back, go back. He's in, in the woods. I don't see your gun belt. Nope. You would see it. It sticks out. Yeah. Is uh, is this in this area right here? Is that's not his town that he's a cop in, correct? No. No. no it, it's it's not. Um, We're a few miles from Centerville, right here. Small uh, small town. Centerville does not have police. Okay, so we're a rural area. So most of all of our town. Is the sheriff is what we use there, sheriff officers. And when you call nine one one, what's a typical response time for this sheriff? Probably 10, 15 minutes. And folks, and that's why I keep telling you, you are your own first line of defense. Uh, when when seconds count, uh, the cops are going to be minutes away. In this case, 10, 15 minutes away in the rural areas of uh, sometimes it's even worse than that. 20, 30 minutes away, depending on how large the county is. Um, and, and where they're at at the time. That's exactly right. So you got to be able to protect yourself. You got to be able to uh, be self-reliant here. Ed, I don't see a gun belt. Nope. 
Um, but if he was a righty, it, the gun would be on the right side, you know, right there. But you know, unless he was wearing some kind of pancake holster on his right hip or something, but he doesn't have a gun belt on. Definitely not official, you know, like uniform gun belt. No, so ta first, no taser. So the first officer on the scene is just somebody driving through or driving back home or driving from home to uh, his to his um, place of uh, place of work, his geographical area of employment. Yes, my understanding is that he saw the bus swerving and then he turned around to follow the bus. Mm -hmm. So he was just passing through. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. That explains why he didn't. Shut I mean, I would have I would have considered volleying shots at, at that guy. I would have freaking at least unloaded one magazine at him. Yeah. At that at, at that distance with a handgun, you're not going to hit him. I, I was a good 25 yard. I used to I used to hit the target from 25 yards. I wasn't one of those guys. They do really. say that this that cop there was a marathon runner, and the local sheriff and everyone say have said he runs like a gazelle. They said he could have tracked him down in probably about 30 seconds. Is he, is he the Forrest Gump of the police department there? Yeah. <laughs> oh, shit. Um. So, let's let the. <laughs> and all this you're fixing here, you'll see another. You'll hear a police car coming, and that's going to be. Was it the sheriff or DPS? That was all DPS. Officers. DPS. So we have a large, our little area right there. We're right on the interstate, I-45 that goes from Houston to Dallas, and we have a great DPS there, Department of Public Safety. That's Highway Patrol, and mm -hmm. great, great, great guys. Our sheriffs are great. Our highway patrols are great. They know everybody and they really take care of everyone. And so at some point in time, this call probably came in and you could immediately hear a highway patrol that was probably down just down the street there. So, wow. Yeah. So once the call goes out, we have to assume that they had an emergency call box in the um, inside the bus. There has to be. Uh, and, and if there isn't shame on them, but I, I would have to bet, uh, I would, I, I would have to guess that there's some type of emergency, um, uh, device in that bus. If there is something that goes on, once that's activated, then the troops start responding from wherever. And it depends on how far away. And I talked to you, Melanie, about this earlier is that some backup could be 20, 30, 40 miles. And if they're on a call, then they got to, you know, get rid of the, you know, call or the situation and, and respond. Uh, and depending on what the call is, they might not be able to respond. So that's the, that's the danger of this. But you, uh, I had asked you and you said time is really hard to tell. Like yeah. how long did it take for additional units to get there? And you said anywhere from five to 10 minutes, right? Yeah, it, it, it's hard for me to uh, determine that. It just, yeah. It was such an intense moment. You know, what seems like things happen fast. They could be really moving slow or, right. you know, right. it just, it's hard to tell. Look at this super chat coming in from Revenge. I don't know if you guys can see it on the screen. It says, good day, Braxton from Australia. Oh, awesome. You are my hero. You are my new hero. Well done. You did great. Awesome. So that's, that's for you, Braxton from Australia. So. That's awesome. Crocodile Dundee town. And, you know, people argue that Crocodile Dundee wasn't from Australia, but put another prawn on the Barbie. That's what I the, said. The, right. real, the real Crocodile Dundee had a bit of a criminal past. I've heard. Just saying. All right. Let's, let's <laughs> let the rest of this play because um, we have to give uh, Braxton credit where credit is due. Um, one more super chat's coming in from Joe Murray. That's our uh, attorney. Uh, Melanie and um, uh, Robert Braxton. He's the one who um, who gave me the advice for you guys to you know give you the okay. So Joe Murray, criminal defense attorney. He sends in a super chat and he says, "What an amazing story! God bless this wonderful family for taking action." He too is a retired police officer from New York City and now a criminal defense attorney. Awesome. So, all right. Let's let the, let's let the full thing go here, and then we could wrap it up. Um, I can't play it without it. Okay, there we go. Oh my god! I wonder if I wonder if the guy's okay. What guy? The um. Thank <laughs> you. 
He's in the woods. Wow. You can hear sirens in the background. So I'm going the woods. So that's Braxton saying, I saw him go in the woods. Yeah. See, the rest of those prisoners couldn't get out of their handcuffs. Oh, everything went down. So here's the sirens. This is the troops coming, or one guy at least responding. Yeah, so it was it was minutes. It wasn't. Wait, I want to uh, be on the news. Me. You hear Braxton? Am I going to be on the news? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he ran, at the, he ran towards the house. Listen to this. Yeah, somewhere near that house. So I was in that house might want to be careful. Be on the news. <laughs> yeah, he ran at that. He ran towards the house. You think? Yeah, somewhere near that house. That's a so big ranch right the house, there. Might want to be careful. Is that the entrance to the ranch right there? It is. It's also the staging area for this search right now. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, he ran at that. He ran towards the house. So that's it right there. Yes. Okay. Uh, how, big, how big is that ranch? Oh, I don't know. It's a couple hundred acres. Isn't it? Yeah, they they had it's purchased that about a year ago, and it's gonna it's gonna be. Gosh, when that was for sale, I think they told me it was two hundred and. It's 225 acres, something like that. Goes, right. And it goes way back creeks mm -hmm. and other creeks. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if she sent you a picture of the bridge. There's a big creek right next to it. I, I'm not sure if she got That's a picture of it. Yeah. It's, nice uh, push your legs a little bit in Texas. Here's, here's another couple of messages that I missed that came in for Braxton from MK. She sends in a super chat for 20 bucks and she says, for Braxton, I have family in Houston and League City. Braxton is a great kid. Aww. Thank you, MK. Uh, thank you so much. I'm going to read the next one because these are all coming in as we were showing stuff. So let me get to, we, we read uh, criminal defense attorney Joe Murray's, and then one came in from Rocky Pastorino. Now, Rocky, uh, like you guys, is a, a, a great American hero as well. He is in uh, Fernley, Nevada, and in the Naomi Arion case, she was uh, the young 18-year-old who was um, murdered outside of Walmart in uh, Nevada. And he, as a citizen, started a search group to search for her. And um, he became friends with the family, with her brother. Uh, and he is, again, a, another true American hero in Nevada who took it upon himself to search for this girl and he searched night and day and uh, helped. Um, he mobilized over 500 people one day, and wow. they searched searched the desert for this for for this girl, who turned out, uh, you know, wound up being murdered by a sick, evil monster. Uh, but he is now behind bars and and, and arrested. So um, Rocky sends in a super chat and says, "Fantastic job, you guys, citizens at their best." That's right. That's right. If you see something, say something. That's what it's all about. Absolutely. Um, so I think I got to everybody. Um, it, you know, these these kind of situations bring communities sometimes apart and they bring them together because there's mixed bags of emotion. Some people have, you know, uh, opinions on what people should do and shouldn't do. But I want to just say this as a law enforcement professional and as Ed can tell you, and many of the folks who listen, Gene himself knows because he is somebody who gives um, himself and volunteers and is public servant in, in some different uh, shape or form. When you see um, somebody in need or somebody that is in trouble, it's, uh, it's within ourselves and in humanity to do something to help somebody. It's the same concept. If you see somebody fall in the middle of the street, you're going to go and offer help to them. This was correction officers in distress. Melanie and her son would just happen to be driving on highway seven and said, you know, something's not right here. And they took action and they did what they thought was the right thing. And it was the right thing. Um, but you have people who sometimes will question no matter what good somebody does, they'll question it. And you have to just pay attention to, you have to dis disregard the white noise. You have to stay focused on what your heart and your soul is telling you you did was right. 
So again, I can't overemphasize the importance to you, Melanie, to understand that there's always going to be the naysayers. Misery loves company. And, you know, those folks, if they were put in that same position, there's no telling how they'd react. Um, right. And you did the right thing. So um, kudos to you and Braxton. Uh, we got some police badges coming out to Braxton and some goodies and some police memorabilia cards from New York. And Ed, hopefully you can come through with the sheriff star for him. No, Ranger star. Different, Ranger. different. Totally, totally different. All right. Okay. So, All right. So All right. So I know you guys probably want to wrap up, um, maybe. But one thing that you played the video of the gentleman talking earlier, and I don't know if we ever got to that point to where – the that's the representative for TDCJ. His story has been totally mixed um, from the start and keeps changing his story, but he seems to be trying. He doesn't like women. <laughs> we can tell that with his interviews with the women, when they ask a question, he's really harsh. His on demeanor them. changes. And right? he's kind of almost, I don't, I don't know if the terminology would be shaman Melanie or, or, or what, He's discounting or what, every time it's brought up. Yeah. They're what, what's going on is we handed or Melanie handed over that video within two hours from a TDCJ uh, workers. And that, actually not just workers, but these were like a warden kind of guys that were starting to drive the country roads and all that. So we were at home and we saw him and Melanie goes, I need to give that guy that this video, they need to get it to him so they can see where this guy went. So she gave the guy uh, the video. It was actually 6 p.m. on that day. Um, and so he said, I'm going to get this video um, to our main guy, which is command, to the guy in command, so they can see this and see what's going on. So hmm. five, six days, this guy that is getting interviewed just com constantly, twice a day, keeps saying, I don't know what video this is. I haven't seen a video. I wish she would come forward and let us know because we could probably use that. But we we don't we don't know who this woman is. And after three days of that, I got frustrated. And Melanie didn't know this, but I called what they call the OIG in Huntsville, Texas. Um, Huntsville, Texas is like the head of the state of the prisons. So that's where all the offices are. I called there and talked to a lady, and she said, "Oh." Well, we need to know this information. Let me put you through to command. And they put me through to what I understood was the main guy in command right there. Told him about the video, um, kind of what we have. He goes, well, we'll probably contact you down the road. Uh, we're, we're more worried about getting the prisoner, which is understandable. We're getting the prisoner now, but that video means nothing to us. And so it's just kind of a bizarre thing going on and they've got the video. The guy knows they have the video, but it just makes you discount the TDCJ. There's just some red flags with it all and his story doesn't add up. And, you know, why would you not want to have the video and look at the video instead of just taking your employees words for something, you know? Well, um, you did the, you did the right thing. And the bottom line is don't let this uh, dishearten you. And, you know, remember Galatians 6, 9, never grow weary of doing the right thing. Yeah. Okay. I have to say this, the, you know, the, the, the fact that he came on television with the reporters and discounted you, Melanie, I know what you're feeling because I got that same sense. Even before you told me that, uh, I watched it and I said to myself, well, why, why is he, um, discounting video footage that I saw from, you know, yeah. another another news outlet, you know, Sarah played that clip right. before she before he was asked about it. And 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 there we saw him discount it. And, you know, it's like a kick in the pants to somebody that did something good. I feel that he should have been uh, complimentary and said, hey, we want to thank our civilians and our folks over here in um, in all of the counties, uh, Centerville, uh, you know, and, and, and the surrounding counties, because we need your help. He should be encouraging and, and giving thanks and praise for that, where he doubled down and pretty much discounted. Like, I don't know this lady. I don't know what she I mean, I played it for that reason. Um, I played it because I wanted everybody to see that. And we're going to continue to pound that home. And I feel that it's important that they acknowledge um, you and, 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 and encourage 
people going forward, because let's not forget, this guy is still a fugitive from justice. He's still out there. And we right. need somebody else, if they are to, God forbid, come up against this guy, to step up uh, and not shut their door and say, well, I'm going to call 911 and button down the hatches. You know, and, you, so, and you have a vital piece of information there. It is the last known direction that this guy was traveling. How do you dismiss that? That That's ridiculous. A lot of this doesn't add up to me whatsoever from the inmate cutting through that wire mesh in the bus. The, or not mesh, but I mean, plate. yeah. Plate. I mean, I don't even know how that's possible, but there's just so many things that, you know, that he has told us are what his accounts of what has happened from the from the guards on the bus that just do not add up to what I drove up and witnessed myself. And those guards weren't even there. Yeah. I don't know how he could say they ran and shot at him when they were not there. From the time I left, when DPS arrived, four or five cars pulled up at the very end. And I was like, okay, there's plenty of help now here. So I'm out. Um, hey, I, I, I don't want to be critical, super critical of law enforcement, but there were, there was red flags that just jumped out at all over me during that press conference. And, and I'm going to hold back now a little bit because um, I wait to see when the dust settles, because, you know, in the beginning of, of an investigation, there's a lot of chaos and the and misinformation is flying and it takes a while before things get um, organized and the right. true information comes out. But, but something he said there disturbed me greatly um, about um, the actions and I'm going to hold uh, hold off until I hear a little more uh, because uh, I just it just didn't make sense to me what he was saying uh, about the actions right. of the uh, corrections officers. But anyhow, um, I don't know if you saw this, Braxton, but uh, one of one of our good friend from the Nevada is sending you 20 bucks. No. Yeah, we, we have a, we, we, we have, a, have a, that'll buy a lot of robots. We, <laughs> Braxton, uh, Braxton, we have quite a bit more than 20 bucks coming your way. So uh, I'll have to send it to mom. You'll have to trust her to divvy it up to you. So mom, before, you know, uh, tomorrow or whenever, you know, we get a chance, you're going to send me, me away in PayPal or whatever, how I could send all the super chats that were directed to him. And, you know, you guys can use it as you see fit. Um, all, that's all of the crime time with Duty Ron family saying congratulations and thank you for what you did before I let them with the, the Tipperman family go. And is it, is that, am I pronouncing it right? Or is it Tipperman? Tipperman. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry about that. You know, my last name is Licardi and people always say Licardi or Licardi. And I go, listen, uh, as long as you're close, I'm okay with it. All right. But uh, I want to show the inside of one of these buses. This isn't the bus, but this is the way, this is a similar setup to um, this Bluebird coach bus. And I'm only going to show the inside and the gate, uh, and it's got the gate set up in the back for the guard. So I want I want you guys to take a peek at this because it shows the um, the actual gating that encloses the driver and then in the back. So I'm going to give you guys a little bit, if you guys have time, if you could stay, yeah. uh, Rob. Any right, time. Yeah, yeah. Let's, 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 let's show this. I'm going to go full screen with it, and I'm going to let it play straight through. And there's some narration by this gentleman who purchased this. He's, he's actually buying this from Surplus, and he's going to turn it into like a motor home. So let's listen to what he has to say. And this is the driver's seat with the requisite million uh, knobs and buttons and things on the side. I've actually got this all figured out now. It runs pretty well. Uh, it's got intercom system and a few little features left over from the days of uh, running prisoners. Um, this is a list I found on the bus. 82 cuffs, two chains, 13 leg irons. And then this one over here is actually a list of prisons in the state. This must have been the route the driver took uh, with all the prisoners. All right, so up front behind the driver, you've got this big old lockbox. And inside is not a whole lot of stuff, just kind of some boxes and trash and whatnot. Um, but there is this box of papers, a bigger kind of tour of the bus. Uh, you've also got a jump seat here for probably another guard or any passengers to ride on. And there's a phone system. There's actually three phones in the bus uh, that connect the driver to the two additional guards. 
And then this is the door separating the driver from the prisoners. And you can see it just slides open and shut and there's some plexiglass on here. Um, inside the bus, it is in really, really good condition. Condition. This is a 16 year old bus and there is not one bit of graffiti, not one tear on any of the Two, bus security will remove chain procedures. Um, in case of emergency, number one, stay seated. Two, bus security will remove chains. You will remain handcuffed. And three, passengers on the opposite side of the driver will be evacuated first. So over on this side, bus security will direct you to a safe area. So they were chained up in the bus, and it shows the bus is in good shape on the inside. No cuts or tears or graffiti or anything. Uh, it does have a couple of um, uh, emergency exits. They pop open for fresh air and are watertight when they're closed. It's also got these two big old air conditioning units, one on either side. There's one there and one here. So it was uh, set up with AC and heat. Uh, that's because none of these windows open. They're all wedged shut from the outside. Not welded shut, but they're just little wedges on the outside that lock them shut. Uh, in the back, you've got a stainless steel commode, and that goes to a black water tank underneath, and there's also a water tank. And um, then there's this other area here for another guard. So this back guard would be locked up in the back and uh, has a seat back here, emergency exit. And uh, let's see what else. There's a cup holder right here and a switch for a heater. That's a heater underneath the seat for the guard. And there's the other phone. So the guard in the back can talk to the guard up in front. So there was a look at front and back of these setups. This is obviously not the bus, but this is the... 21 seats for prisoners, so that would make for about 42 prisoners here on the bus. So there's a good look at the gating, and this may or may not be the exact setup, but it just gives you an idea of what you have to... would. In this case, what you would have to cut through, what they described was um, uh, a metal meshing or metal uh, 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 kind of underneath, like a there's like a pass through. And I don't know why or how they would think that that's OK to have. But um, this is just your standard uh, prison bus uh, setup. Um, and uh, I just wanted to show you guys this real quick. I hope that gives you a little bit a better yeah. of, a, you know, a, be a little bit of better of a view of what. Um, what the driver was looking at and what was going on. Ed, you got anything to say about this prison bus setup? Well, like I said, I would like to, uh, I would like to examine it myself, to be quite honest with you. I'm very curious about how he got through that, uh, that metal. Yeah. So in I mean, it's, it's just unbelievable, but um, so I'll let the, I'll let the, I'll let that finish off and we'll come back to us. Gene, we didn't get to talk about a lot of drone stuff, but we love having you here because you are a wealth of information. We're going to let uh, Melanie and her husband and, and, and their, son, their son go, uh, but definitely, Melanie, if you can, uh, send me the coordinates for how I can get the cash for the kid. Uh, of course. So, yeah. Um, I'll tally up everything that we got in Super Chats, and I'll send it on over to you tomorrow in the morning when I get up. Now, Braxton, don't use this for junk food. All right. <laughs> what do you want to do when Braxton? What do you want to do when you grow up? What do you want to be? Uh, a YouTuber and a, a prior cracker like my dad. Oh, okay. Crack some bones, huh? <laughs> no thought to be in law enforcement. Never know. <laughs> no. I might need I... one, but I'm not. My, but I'm. I might not become one. Okay. All right. We always you can use good men yeah. and women. <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to say That's thank you. I want to say thank you to you guys. Uh, you got you guys are a great family, Melanie, Robert, uh, and Braxton. Um, I'm hoping that you know maybe you would consider coming back to Crime Time with Duty Ron and hanging out with us uh, for updates. If you have anything additional that we can that can enhance us with the reporting and, you know, giving us an idea of what um, the makeup is of the, of your location and where you are. It, it's so helpful to understand 
you know, um, it, it really helps with the story reporting. And I, and I think it's important that uh, everybody here, when they watch this and watch the replay, they'll get a better understanding of what, uh, what, what they're, what they're up against and how vast of an area it is to search and how heavily wooded and uh, how many empty homes uh, that are there just for vacationing or seasonal hunting, you know? Right. Yeah. So, we appreciate you, uh, Ron, that Melanie has gotten uh, messages from different places, CNN, which eh, we couldn't do CNN. So. <laughs> but, um, but when your message came across and she always talks to me, sends me a, a message on that. She's, she went to your video and watched the video and she repeated back. She goes, I really like this guy, Ron. I, I think I want to talk to him. I, I want, I want people to hear my story. And so you've been excellent. And we, I know she really appreciates you. She's had yeah. some breakdown moments today and you have, you have really lifted her uh, back out of it. So. Yeah. I really do appreciate it. Well, Melanie, it all comes straight from the heart. And when Ed and, you know, Ed and I were talking about it, and I told Gene quickly when, when he, when he got here, we were all just thrilled to have you uh, come on with us because again, you know, we did the job of, uh, you know, law enforcement for a long time, Ed and I, and now we're civilians just like you guys. So um, we have deep appreciation because we know firsthand that we rely on the public to help us solve some of these crimes or, or to be witnesses to certain situations like this. Uh, and and you were instrumental and your son uh, having the wherewithal to start recording and Braxton, although we got parts of your door panel and stuff like that, you got all the main stuff. He got all the, he got the guy out in the field and FBI and different, uh, you know, uh, software can enhance that and make it really clear and, and, and concise. So it's, it's really great. Uh, it look at this. Easy for them to kind of push me to the side with having the information, but if it were not for social media, allowing me to be able to post this and you guys see it and take it and, and help me get the story out and, my account of what happened and what I witnessed, you know, it would have been easy for them to push me aside, you know, back before we had YouTube and Facebook and all these ways to get information out, you know, they would have pushed me aside and nobody would have heard this. Nobody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's why I thought it was very important for me to reach out to you. And I didn't know if you were being overwhelmed with uh, comments and people wanting to interview you. I just simply wanted to get uh, a better a better understanding of what went on, and and you helped do that uh, for me. And then and then yeah. now here you are telling your story, so it's fantastic. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. Yeah. Do you guys know what uh, what um, Texas Ranger Troop covers your area? Rob knows more than law enforcement. The Texas, than which Texas Ranger does? No, the troop. Yeah, what Texas Ranger Troop covers your like Troop B, Troop A. You know? Oh, that I do not know. I know we are, you know, we're mostly DPS in this town. Um, mm -hmm. sheriff, sheriff, like I said, the sheriff's office is our county. And then um, we have DPS, which is Highway Patrol. Mm -hmm. And I, I couldn't tell you which which one it is exactly. I, I could not. All right. When I get when I get off the uh, video with you, I'm going to call my buddy over in the Texas Rangers and uh, – See if we can't get him to swing by your place and, and meet Braxton and give him that pin. That would be. Uh, That's even better. So mm -hmm. special for Braxton. It wow. Super, super nice. Yeah. That would be so awesome. <laughs> While Z Pony uh, sends in a $20 super chat and says, Braxton has a future in law enforcement. Thank you for the video and audio. You are a superstar. Um, there's just so <laughs> many comments coming through for you, Braxton. It's just unbelievable. Um the the replay would be worth your while to watch it and just look at all these comments because wow. I can highlight um, I can highlight these things all night long uh, but uh, a lot of love pouring out in the in the chat for you and for your family don't forget Braxton you did this with your mom and um, you guys were a team that day and your father's uh, assistance was there guiding you so um everything that your dad taught you uh and your mom uh came into play there and and it's it's such a great thing so 
Um, I have still photos from the scene. Okay. I have a bunch of things Feel that free she to use anything I've sent. Say again. Feel free to use anything that I have sent you. Okay. okay. And uh, Ed, that would be Alpha Company of the Texas Rangers. Alpha. Okay. Thanks, Gene, for looking that up. <laughs> All right. Thanks. All right, so uh, I'm going to let the Tieperman family go. We've had them an hour and 29 minutes, so um, much love and respect from my house to yours. And beyond, on behalf of Crime Time with Duty Ron and this community, you got a new family here. You can come on anytime. You can message me. You guys can text me. Uh, Robert, you got my cell. I'll share Ed's uh, information with you. And Gene, if it's okay with you, I'll share your information with them as well. Absolutely. All right, great. So uh, thank you, Braxton, Mom, and Dad. You guys are awesome. We'll see you guys again. And then we're gonna, All right, Braxton. We're going to continue again with Gene. Wow, wait a minute. Hold on, Braxton, before you go. Look at this. Boom. Way to go, Braxton. I'm going to catch the replay, says Montana Mama. So, all right, guys. Good night from New York and good night thank from you. Texas. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank Bye -bye. you, family. Wow, what a wonderful family, guys. Mm -hmm. um, that just, uh, for me, is just a, is a game changer. And um, Gene, if, if you, I know, you know, we get, both you and I are old guys. We get tired. And Ed was yawning on me today. No, it's just, that's because I'm taking care of a baby dog. Okay, yeah, okay, Ed, whatever. Can we show some of your stuff from your YouTube channel, Gene? I would like to. Um, um, I, I have some stuff queued up. Um, Gene Robinson on the locate demo. Would you sure. want to play that? Let it roll. Yeah, sure. yeah, let's do that. So this is Gene Robinson. He's got a YouTube channel. I encourage okay, everyone to go over we'll and subscribe to it. Um, this is going to be him teaching us about. And could you just tell everybody what locate's about before I play this? Sure. You know the uh, actually drones. The the golden drones is the data it collects, and those are the images. And we collect a lot of them. And uh, you use the standard issue Mark one eyeball to look at them, and you've got 2,000 of them. It takes a long time to look at them. So locate was re in response to that. How do you pull information out? And this gentleman in Canada came up with this software package, uh, and uh, I'm going to give his website a plug. It's uh, usri.ca. And uh, you can... And, and this has advanced so much further since this video was made. I need to make another video on it because you can just select any color from the color wheel and it will search literally through thousands of pictures and identify any pictures that has the color in it that you designate. Wow. So you can take 2,000 images and process them at four images per second and how, it how will many, how many images a second four images per second wow and it will separate the ones that have your color in it so out of 2000 you may have a hundred or 10 or in this particular area where you're heavily wooded with green if it was uh, like the white color you could actually say find me big white blobs and it would go through and pull those out. Uh, white is a little bit more difficult color to, for it to, to look for, but I can tell you that uh, all the rest of the colors that it, it's just spot on, and you only need to see one pixel. One pixel in that picture out of 20 million pixels, wow. if it matches, it will show you where that is. And we did, we found a red sports car. Everybody talks about tree canopy. Wow. Uh, we found a red sports car because we got to see one little bitty piece peeking through the canopy. I would have never have seen it. That's, but that's, that's incredible. It was circled. There it was. Go look at it. Well, go, boys, there's the car. Right. Yeah. Good stuff. That's amazing. Let, let's let this play for a few. I'm not going to play the whole thing. Joe Murray sent in a $100 super chat. I think I highlighted it on the screen. He said, God bless this wonderful family. We love you. Uh, you Joe did. Murray, Joe Murray is suffering from COVID. He caught it on. Again? A, oh, no. He went to a wedding out of town, one of his boxing friends, and it would, became a super spreader. A bunch of people got sick, and uh, I talked to him tonight. Uh, you know, I was talking about Melanie and whether it was safe for her to come on and talk. And he reassured me it was safe. She was good. 
And then once he gave me the green light, I called her and texted her. Then her husband texted me. But so Joe has been communicating. He basically sounds like he's got a bad cold. It's not like the first time where he had to be hospitalized. Right. So thank God we're going to send prayers to Joe Murray for full recovery of this nasty uh, China virus or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and, and and hopefully, you know, uh, Joe makes it, uh, makes it through and fights it off, you know. So, all right, here we go. Let's play it. Locate. The exercise is a guide to using the basic functions of Locate Pro Multi-Channel Dynamic Algorithm Search, or MDOS. Our test site is typical of the environment you would encounter in a variety of places, with an assortment of trees and low to mid waist high vegetation, along with several man-made objects. The site we flew covers approximately 16 acres of a 175-acre ranch in Texas. We collected data with a standard DJI Phantom 4 Pro with a 20 megapixel imager while flying at an altitude of 150 feet AGL. Thank you, Gail. The ground sampling distance, or GSD, with this sensor and at this altitude is just under one half inch per pixel. The targets There's the dog. are 12 by 12 inch foam rubber mats in pastel colors. Nine have numbers, three have letters, and the remaining two are solid colors. Additionally, there are four 12 by 12 square paisley or tie-dyed colored cotton bandanas stretched over plywood sheets. Thanks, Rocky. We are utilizing the Pix4D capture software to set up a 2D grid that could easily be flown with one battery. The overlap is set to 60% forward and 70% side lap. This ground control software will set the camera angle to very close to nadir or 90 degrees or just slightly less to make up for the aircraft tilt and forward flight. Mm -hmm. For your own use, you can reduce or increase the overlap as you normally would, but recommend at least 50% overlap in both axes of the image. Locate will process as many images as you collect and do it very quickly. It is important to ensure your camera settings are correct so that color renditions are as true to natural as possible. Most cameras will allow for a variety of color themes, but we want to avoid those as they can distort the true colors in the images. For this flight, the white balance was set to auto, the exposure was set to normal, and auto exposure was lucky. lucky. Since Fine. this is a DJI drone, the color can also be selected and we set this to normal. You should make it a habit to check these settings before every flight to avoid having to refly missions because of incorrect settings. MDOS color channels are comprised of the three primary colors of red, green, and blue, or RGB, and the second channels of yellow, cyan, and magenta. In MDOS, there is no hard and fast line or demarcation between a primary and secondary color channels, but the arc of each of the six color channels is around one third of the color wheel representation given here. As a general rule, you should select one primary and one complementary secondary color to scan. We know that even the brightest of colors will appear to fade the further away you get from them. A screen called Analyze to help us describe how the limiter analysis workflow will become apparent. To explain mm -hmm. the limiter, we will use a tool in the view screen called Analyze to help us describe how the limiter works. There will be another video going into much more detail with the analyzer published later. To describe the limiter, we will open the red shirt image included with the sample data set. We have zoomed into the picture to show a box that- Hey, Gene, I want to ask you, did was this used uh, when you guys did drone stuff on Summer Wells? Extensively. We've used it extensively. Every image that has been taken on the Wells case has been processed through Locate. We are going to do a special with Dave Rader and Twyla Cisco because June 15th, as we know, is going to be one year mark yep. uh, that she's been uh, missing. Um, so we're going to do a, um, a search update and program uh, on Summer Wells probably in the first week of June. Uh, so I'm going to invite you, uh, please, if you can, to come on and talk about Locate and some of the, you know, some of the technology that was used. I know you and Chris went out there with Twyla and with the lead detective, Pruitt, right? Yes. Uh, and there was uh, extensive uh, drone flights um, done in the past. So we're going to get into that and we're going to talk a little bit about that. But 
Um, any anything on this where I should fast forward or is um, I wanted to see. No, it. I, I wanted it, to see it's it. yeah, it, it's it's really a whole lesson on, you know, how to actually use the software. But what you want to get from the entire thing is, is, well, aside from the fact that it has been improved significantly since that version. But the uh, the idea is, is that it doesn't rely on a human being to actually go through each one of those images and look for something of a particular color or size. And let me tell you that I've gone through all my old records, all my old data and stuff like that, and it has been bang on every time. If you can see your victim or you can see what your victim has on, it will find it literally every time. And it's, uh, uh, it's, it's an amazing thing to watch work, and uh, the analysis tools are just super. And uh, now that uh, they, he's uh, actually come up with using FLIR stuff, we're, we're actually using this software on our clandestine graves research that we're doing. And uh, it's, it's been a very significant contributor to being able to get that TOD, that, that, that uh, placement, from you know day one all the way out through you know the the third fourth fifth month right. and uh, we're going to be coming up with some some really good uh, uh, uh research data here in just a little bit we're starting the co the compilation of the data now and uh it's gonna it's gonna change the way drones are used in those uh, those sort of cases i'm excited about it gene and i, I want to continue to promote this because this this stuff is just invaluable when you have missing persons and even these criminals that, that go on the run. Um, these, this image here, um, I love to see drone imaging, but I love to see it when it's, you know, in, in play with uh, advanced software and, and stuff like this. Um, what are we looking at here? Uh, this is, again, this is a test site and uh, it, it, it's your typical drone image. And you would have to drill down into it. You'd have to look at every little piece there, you know, hoping that, you know, your color vision was good enough that you would pick something up. Uh, this, if you let it run just a little bit further, it will show the, uh, the targets as it finds the targets and it actually circles them. So you can't miss it. Uh, when it, when it does find them, there you go. Boom. See, it, it found everything. Now that's too many, but, there are ways to filter that down until you get down to what your primary color is you're looking for. So these circles, uh, these circles in purple or blue or whatever that color, it looks bluish purple to me. Um, it, that stuff that you guys planted down there to for it to find those in the beginning. No, those are artifacts. Those are things that occur in nature, but you want to filter those out. And that's what this whole process is showing you is how you filter those natural artifacts out until you get to something that's man-made. Now, again, like I say, this is all gone away now. Uh, it, it's got the smarts in it now in, in that it can look at the entire image and see what the background color levels are. And you can ask for any... Um, deviation from the background color data that's there. So you told this software, yeah. okay, look at this image and I'm looking for this color red. Yes. And and it looked at it and it circled all these areas where red was found by the software in its algorithm search. That's, that's correct. That's, right. That's and as you you can fine tune that to the point where uh, we've even been able to find camouflage, mm -hmm. believe it or not, mm -hmm. because you actually key on one of the colors in camouflage. Camouflage is always a tri-color, you know, two or three colors. Mm -hmm. So you key on the one color that doesn't fit the environment. Yeah. And it will and find you, it every time. If you notice lately, uh, the illegal border crosses are coming over in camouflage now. Full, yep. cam full camouflage. Um, I just, uh, I'm getting my hands on a new drone, uh, Gene. I'm getting a, a flare, um, uh, Mov, 
C360 with the um, X-T2 uh, FLIR camera, dual camera system. You're going to like it. Oh, yeah. It's got also wow. has a uh, has a chemical sensor on 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 it uh, that tests for um, uh, volatile organic compounds, toxic industrial chemicals, uh, oxygen, and yep. uh, and a combustible gas indicator. I was yeah, I was I was thinking maybe we we're going to use that to keep tabs on Kara. Yeah. You know? Oh no no okay. <laughs> uh, I promised everybody I would play the the uh, motorcade for El Chapo when he was brought into custody in 2016. So I wanted I want the audience and most people are starting to leave now, but I want people to see the package that this guy had and how they back they they drove him straight into the uh, into the uh, facility. And there was uh, armed uh, with assault rifles, uh, federal agents who b walked backwards and backed up to make sure that there was no escape. And that's how dangerous these felons are, these people who break out of prison and break out of jails. He's a, a notorious drug lord who's now serving uh, life in federal prison. So let me just play this real quick for everybody because I like to keep my promises. Um, and this is the AP footage of El Chapo being brought in in 2016. You can hear, you can hear helicopters too. Helicopters are hovering over and monitoring everything. But right here is the guys in the um, the guys with the machine guns. You see them; they got like green fatigues on. Now watch this. This is uh, Chinatown, uh, New York City, by One Police Plaza, and the uh, Federal Correctional Facility is uh, on the right. Yeah, that's him right there in that black car going in. I watch these guys walk backwards. Uh, they walk to the, they get to the back of that car, and then they walk backwards in with their guns pointing straight out. Now that's a security package. That's yeah. how you you transport a dangerous escapee, felon, murderer, psychotic, drug, you know, kingpin. And that Sally Port door came immediately down once those last uh, foot foot uh, um, security team went in. Yeah, a hundred percent. I'll show the rest of it. It might even show it. The doors cl closing. Yeah. Hey, you can't see it. I mean, look at that motorcade. That's something that you would see like presidential, you know, on a presidential motorcade. But again, you know, you look at these smaller areas and, and Gene, you know about this. You live in Texas. Uh, you know, the the amount of personnel that they have are is limited. So this is. You know, some and look, uh, the, our guys here, you, you know what the situation is at the border right now. I, I'm only four hours away from the border. Um, we see. We see them all the time. And uh, our guys are stretched very, very thin. And then, of course, they have to deal with uh, the, the catch and release program. And I myself have been told, as we went on the border, we said, you know, we can see these people. We can watch them. We can catch them. And they, they said, you know what? That's great. It would be great if we could use it. But we would catch too many. We, we, we don't have the capacity. We, we can't use it because, you know, we'll be expected to do something with them and we can't. Right. So right. the situation is dire to well, say the least. That's disheartening. Yeah. It's very unfortunate. All right. An hour and 48 minutes. We got to wrap this up. This is like a marathon when it's almost like yeah. we're doing another telethon with the uh, Dave Raider and company. Uh, Gene, I want to say thank you. Uh, for all of your, uh, you know, time and all of the things that you do for EquiSearch uh, down there in Texas and for Midwest, you are unbelievable. And you have your own RP search services, a uh, nonprofit uh, 501C. I will link his nonprofit in the description. So if you want to donate to the great work that Gene Robinson does, he searched for Summer Wells. He searched for Orin and Orson West, uh, Sincere and Classic, 
I'm not saying he personally went out to California, but one of his uh, one of his uh, folks, one of his friends, fellow co-pilot, has gone uh, out there and did thousands of images um, uh, for the current, you know, down along the Kern River for uh, Bakersfield. So and we analyze them all. Yeah, we analyzed them all, ran them through everything. So thank you so much for everything that you do. I'm honored to be friends with you, Gene. I am so honored. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, Ed, any final words for the troops? Well, I want to thank Gene as well. I want to thank uh, the Tipperman family um, for uh, joining us tonight. Uh, that was fun. And I want to thank uh, all of our viewers um, for joining in here on the chat and the replay viewers. Yeah. 100%. And thank you all for giving um, generously uh, yeah, for, to, to Braxton. That's yeah. awesome. The look good, good. good. Yeah, Gene and, and Ed, the look on that kid's face was uh, priceless. When he was Man. seeing those super chats come over, he was like, oh, I think he's got enough money to get a drone now, Gene. Yeah. <laughs> you may be right. I, I'm, afra I'm afraid that he's going to buy another rifle, though. <laughs> That's not That's bad a either. Possibility. There yeah. were no the mounts on the wall. Kids, yeah. a, hunter, kids a hunter. Uh, Gene, any final words for the folks? Uh, no. One thing that I want to stress is that citizens can make a difference. Uh, just uh, the, the most minor thing can be the difference between a captured felon and someone else being hurt on down the road. So Amen. If, you, if you see it, say it. I mean, that's the, we can't stress that enough. Yeah. If you see something, say something. We heard James Stinson from the car wash in uh, Indiana. He, he saw something with Vicki White and Casey White, and he he was instrumental in solving that case. So, um, you know, everyday ordinary folks, you have Melanie and her son Braxton uh, taking video and countless other people. So uh, law enforcement needs the public more than you understand, folks. We do need you more than anything uh, to come out and uh, use the tip lines and and, and, and send, in your, uh, send in your information. So as I like to end all these things, God bless the world, God bless the United States of America, and God bless each and every one of us here in the chat, and especially all the victims of crime and their families across the globe. We send them strength, prayers, and positive vibes. Good night, yeah. Good night from Texas, amen. Good night from New York City, and uh, who knows where it is? You know, he's always at an undisclosed location. No, I'm in the city, I'm in the city. Remember, in the city. stay right. safe. Stay prepared. Watch your six. Bingo. Yahtzee. I'll see you guys soon. Thank you for joining. Peace. Thanks, Gene.